with empty hearts we have come that you would fill us up again we are asking that lord you would fill us up with your love that lord oh god in heaven even as we are here with unveiled faces may we be changed into the very image of your son jesus and that lord oh god in heaven the glory will return to you and to you alone lord i ask that you speak through me and that everyone who hears will be blessed and that the name of jesus be glorified in jesus mighty and matchless name we have prayed amen and amen please be graciously seated hallelujah amen and amen praise the name of the lord hallelujah amen praise god hallelujah god is good how many of us have god been good to this week hallelujah amen 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 hallelujah god be praised uh, let's open our bibles to the book of psalms chapter 42 psalms chapter 42 from verses 1 to 8 psalms chapter 42 from verses 1 to 8 is synonymous to the song that we just sang unto the lord hallelujah amen okay in unison can we read together one to go as the deer pants for the water brooks so pants my soul for you O god my soul thirsts for god for the living god when shall i come and appear before god my tears have been my food day and night while they continually say to me where is your god when i remember these things i pour out my soul within me for i used to go with the multitude i went with them to the house of god with the voice of joy and praise with a multitude that kept a pilgrim feast why are you cast down O my soul why are you cast disquieted within me hope in god for i shall yet praise him for he the help of his countenance O my god my soul is cast down within me therefore i will remember you from the land of jordan and from the heights of hermon from the hill Mizar. deep calls unto deep at the noise of your waterfalls all your waves and billows have gone over me the lord com command his loving kindness in the daytime in the night his song shall be with me a prayer to the god of my life hallelujah amen and amen may the lord bless the reading of his word in jesus mighty name amen for the sake of those who are taking records the title of my sermon is a continuation from what we began to look at last week which is consistent with the theme of the month which is um the pursuit of god hallelujah and to be honest the, the inspiration for this came from um there was a period in my life where every new year it was it was a practice every new year i would read the book by aw toza the pursuit of god and the reason for those books um it's because or that particular book is because for you know when paul was telling the church in hebrews that by now um I, I think he was saying that but strong meat belong to them who by reason of use have their senses to discern between right and wrong I, I want to say that that book is strong meat praise the name of the lord you know there are books that you will read that would it would appeal to your senses praise god but i wanted that that book i recommend it for every christian because it did not mince words it it pierced the depths of every heart I, I remember the very first time i took that book to to read i dropped it i dropped it because it was too strong for me why because you know when you're going for a surgery and if the surgery is going to be successful then the surgeon must make sure that it is no trace of what caused the sickness in the first place praise god and that's what that book did to me praise the name of the lord and so that's the motivation behind this book and so um we would never explore it in detail but it's an encouragement or it's a prelude to encourage everyone to please get the book it's a very small book but i i guarantee you, wonder god it would bless your christian experience hallelujah amen okay and so just to give a brief recap of what we did um last week 
um, I started the conversation about the pursuit of God to say that just as plants need sunlight to exist, hallelujah. Uh, for many of us who did biology here, you, would, uh, you are accustomed to the word phototropism. In other words, that by reason of the plant's dependence on sunlight to exist, that when you put a plant, a living plant that is, by the window, you would see that the plant would always tilt towards the direction of the sunlight. Hallelujah. And I said that the same analogy can be likened to the Christian. You know, there was a time in my life when my cousin, I was, I was very young then, just to give an analogy, and my cousin said to me then, was man made for food or food for man? And that my cousin is very deep. So before I could answer, I took my time to think, was man made for food or for food for man? Um, I said, okay, food was made for man. And he said, correct. Because if you said that man was made for food, then that simply means that all the man's life, all he came to do in this earth is just to do what? Eat. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. And the same thing I would transpose to say that was God made for man or man for God. Hallelujah. Because I'm using it to try to make us understand the concept of God or what I call God tropism. In other words, that just as plants rely on sunlight to exist, our life absolutely depends on God for existence. Praise the name of the Lord. I've always said it here in church that life in itself, if you read the God's manual, the scriptures, life was never designed for man to exist outside God. As a matter of fact, the reason why the world is chaotic today is simply because God was taken out of the equation. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. For many of us who did mathematics, they will always say that K is constant. Am I correct? Okay. Okay. I'm wrong. I'm correct. Okay. Praise. At least my school fees did not waste. Praise the name of the Lord. And so the same thing ap applies to human existence. That God was designed to always be constant in every human being's life. And the reason why this is, is because outside God is chaos. Praise the name of the Lord. The moment man chose to do things outside God, the world became chaotic. Many of us who have read Genesis chapter 3, that the reason why if Adam stuck to God's instructions, or Eve stuck to God's instructions, I want to believe that there was no need for what? Salvation. Because all of us will still be in the Garden of Eden. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. And so my charge to anyone here that perhaps you have attempted to live your life outside God, my encouragement to you today is simply to say that it is time to come back home. Praise God. Because your life would not get any better. Not because I'm a prophet of doom. But it's just simple equation. Because what? Man was made for what? God. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. And so Jesus was speaking to disciples in John 15 verse 5. And he gave a metaphor. Because yes, last week we were looking at, if you're going to understand the Bible, there are three key things that you must always take into consideration. Number one is that you must take into consideration what? Anybody can remember? The context. Hallelujah. The context of the person or the context in which the writer is writing what is being written. Number two is what? The metaphors or, or the motives. I don't know how you want to do it. But the idea behind it is that when you're talking about metaphors, you are trying to use, um, you are trying to use, should I say logic or images that we are accustomed to, to explain a complex concept. Hallelujah. And so like the passage that we just read, we saw a metaphor that the psalmist was trying to explain how his heart is longing for God. And so the best way he could communicate that idea was to say that what? As the deer pants hard after the water brooks. In other words, if you have ever seen a deer thirsty, it's a matter of survival. It's life and death. That if I don't get water, 
in this instance, my life is finished. And it says, the same way is the way my life longs hard after God. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Okay? And so I said that in the pursuit of God, we see that the pursuit of God stems from the very beginning. Because when you read Genesis chapter 1, the Bible says that what? In the beginning, what was what? God. Hallelujah. And so it's wisdom that anything you want to do, it is always important that God remains the constant and you and I, what? The variable. Hallelujah. And then I began to explain the doctrine of prevenient grace. In other words, if you think that you are the one who came to God, it's a lie. Praise the name of the Lord. Perhaps you are thinking that your salvation was engineered. It's a lie. Why? Because God was the one who orchestrated the events of your life out of the benevolence of his heart towards you to ensure that you were in a place where the gospel was preached and then you heard and then you believed and then you gave your life to God. Praise the name of the Lord. That that is a proof of prevailing grace. In other words, it's a grace that manifested before you became saved. Hallelujah. So for many of us, for example, you had no choice. Perhaps parents are pastors. You had no choice to choose where you were born. Praise the name of the Lord. But perhaps it was by virtue of you born in that family that brought about you truly coming to the knowledge of the saving grace of Jesus. Hallelujah. For some of us, we are born in ungodly homes. And by virtue of the difficulties of life, somebody told you of a man who is able to change the story. And therefore, by virtue of that, that difficulty, you came to the saving grace of God. So in other words, or anything, any event of your life that pushed you to the point of salvation, it's a proof of the prevenient grace of God. Am I making sense? Hallelujah. And so you realize that this is the grace that comes before any decision or any endeavor. And the theologians say that it is the love of God that constantly woos us. It is the will of God that keeps drawing us. It is the desire of God that keeps pursuing us. And it's the gift of God that constantly frees us. And so Jesus validated this claim when he said in John 6, 44, that no one, no one comes to the Father except what? My Father draws him. And I gave this example last week that one of the reasons why when Jesus would judge the world, he would judge the world not because they were evil. It was because they heard the gospel they chose not to believe. Because the truth is, if the Bible says everybody would hear, everybody would hear. Praise God. And so, everybody would hear. So that on the day that you say, oh, and you want to feign ignorance, perhaps, God will have a DVD on that day. He would just play the tape of the day they told you, the CCTV camera, the day someone preached to you, perhaps some of you is in this church. But God forbid, everybody here will make Jesus. Hallelujah. That perhaps they will play your tape on that day. And it will be that you heard, but you still chose not to believe. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. And so I said that the response, then the response, because the truth is that the idea behind the pursuit of God is that he first of all woos you in. Praise God. So if you think that Christianity is a faith that God does all the wooing, it's a lie. Praise God. Can you imagine any marriage where the husband or the wife is always the one doing the effort? It's a matter of time. The marriage will crash. Praise the name of the Lord. Why? Because the two must continually keep doing things to pursue each other if the marriage is going to thrive. Because many a times, the reasons why marriages go through turbulent times is because when the man took his affection on, on the lady, he was pursued. Praise God. 
But the moment he got her, he felt that there was no longer need to pursue. That is the same thing with us as believers. So you think that the day you gave your life to Christ, that's the end of the pursuit. Go and ask those whose marriages are thriving. The secret is that what I chase daily after my wife or my husband. Because that is the only way to keep the what? Fire aflame. And so the same expression has to be transposed in our Christian experience if really we are going to make the most of this thing called Christianity. Praise the name of the Lord. And so I said that the response to receiving eternal life is then what? To do what? To pursue after God. Because the truth is, the longer you pursue after God, if he's really the God that I know, the God of the Bible, the more you pursue him, the more you want to keep what? Pursuing him. And so I gave that caveat or that warning. If you notice that at some point in time in your Christian walk, that your heart is no longer there to pursue God is a proof that what? You are gradually slipping away. Because you see this thing called sin or backsliding, it did not start one day. Praise God. The Bible said I want a little living. A little living. All it takes is just one compromise after the other. One compromise after the other and all of a sudden you will look back and realize what has God done in my life? Praise the name of the Lord. And so the response to you, that's why I said, as plants rely on sunlight to exist, if indeed heaven is your objective, if indeed eternal life, and when I say eternal life, it's not just limited to living a life forever. It is to live the God's quality kind of life. Praise the name of the Lord. If eternal life is your desire, then you understand that you need God. Because eternal life is what? The God kind of life. That's why it's called what? Zoe. Praise the name of the Lord. And so here, John 17 verse 3 will tell us that what? And this is what? Eternal life. That they may what? Know you. The only true God. And Jesus Christ whom what you have sent. Praise God. Hallelujah. And so we keep going deeper. And so you understand, like I said earlier on, that pursuit, that you pursuing God is a proof of your response to what he has done. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. And I said here that the instrument, the instrument that will help us to pursue God based on scripture, hallelujah, is what? Your heart. I've said it here over and over again. That the greatest treasure anybody must cherish is your heart. Just as how biologically you need your heart to survive. Spiritually you need your heart to survive. Praise God. Because when your heart is corrupted. When your heart is corrupted. It is the mercy of God that will bring about your salvation. Praise the name of the Lord. Because when you read what Paul was saying, he was saying that what? Because they rejected the gospel, God gave them to what? A debased mind. So in other words, it, their heart was stony. And you have, if you have ever tried to pour stone, sorry, pour water on a rock, you know the end of that water is a waste. Because no element of that water would get through the rock. Hallelujah. And so you realize that your heart is the most cherished treasure. And so when Solomon was writing in Proverbs 4 verse 23, saying that guard your heart with what? All what? Diligence. In other words, as for many of us who have seen on social media, when they say this year is a year that you know grief for anybody. In other words, you don't, you don't give room. That statement is scriptural. Because Ephesians 4, Paul says what? Give no room to what? The devil. And so you realize that for you as a believer, you must be what? Rugged about your salvation. You must cherish it with all your heart. 
Because you know if any, and that's why the Holy Spirit, again, I say it, for people who backslide, if they tell you the truth, the Holy Spirit has been nudging them over and over again. Has been prompting them, don't do this. Don't say this. Don't go there. But that excuse of, I can handle it. I can handle it. I can handle it. And it's from one handling to another handling until it gets out of hand. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Because he has been nudging you. That's because the idea of the Holy Ghost is to guide us to ensure that what we reach the destination. He's our GPS. He guides us all through our life journey. That's why the Bible said that too. Because you can imagine the, the disciples. For somebody who has mentored me for so long, all of a sudden, you take him away. You will feel naked and stripped of every sense of protection that you have. And so they were really bothered that Jesus was saying he was going to go. But the, but the Bible said that I will not leave you comfortless. How be it the helper would come, the assignment of the helper is to do what? To guide you into what? All truth. Praise the name of the Lord. And so your heart is highly crucial if you are going to live the God kind of life. So God was saying to the children of Israel in the book of Jeremiah 29. He said that then you will call upon me and go and pray to me. He says that what? I will listen. And you will seek me and find me when you do what? Search me with what? All of your heart. The key part there is what? All. Because we can seek God with some. Praise God. We can seek God with what? Some. I remember when I used to work in the bank then. I wouldn't mention the bank. And so as part of our induction, you know, we would go to different departments. And so for that training, so this guy, and then, that was when the capital markets in Nigeria was booming. So if you ever had a career in the capital markets, you are a big boy, you are a big lady. Because they were the ones that Organizations treated like eggs. That was before the financial crisis. Praise God. So they were earning ridiculous money. And so the guy that came to train us that day, the idea was that he would come to motivate us, young ones who are grown up in the career that, you know, this is the path to take. And this guy, man, his suit alone, like his suit alone that day, every young upcoming guy would say, that's my destination. <laughs> Praise the name of the Lord. I'm going somewhere. And so, after sharing, you know, they were not asking him questions. So, how do you do it? You know, he said, you know, that, you know, I won't lie, I'm a Christian. But, you know, when I come to my desk every morning, I'll just say, God, you know, forgive me for the lie that I'm about to tell today. Praise the name of the Lord. Because his own understanding was that if I was going to make any progress in this career, I have to tell lies. Praise God. And so, it's, it's like those who are lawyers. I'm not saying that you're a liar. No, no, no. I'm just saying that it's, it's, it's how you identify your profession. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Okay? And so, my wife is a lawyer, so don't worry. But she's not a liar. Praise God. Praise the name of the Lord. Okay? So what I'm trying to say is that it is possible because when God, in the Bible, every word matters. And so when the Bible says that when you search for me with all your heart, it's trying to tell us that it is possible that you can seek God with what? A fraction of your heart. So therefore, seven days in a week, I will give God only Sunday. Praise God. I'm seeking God with what? Some of my heart. Praise God. And so you understand that when God is saying, I want all, and the beauty of God is that what? It's either all or what? Nothing. Praise God. It's either all or nothing. So the concept of this book, The Pursuit of God, was trying to say that when God created you and I, 
praise God, that there was a portion, in fact, he designed the heart of man for him to take his rightful place and for only him to be there. Praise God. That's why when you see the Ten Commandments, he says that what? You shall have no what? Other God. Except but what? Me. And one of the things that, that robs us of a great experience, I'm a victim of myself. Praise the Lord. I'm a victim myself. But every day we grow. One of the things that robs us of these things or this experience in God that you and I must begin to deal with is what? Is what is, I want to say is the, in the book, it calls it the tyranny of things. Praise God. The tyranny of things. In other words, you and I believe that if I get this thing, my life will begin to make meaning. So let me break it down. You come from a very poor background. So naturally your motivation is to make money. Because poverty has shown you. Praise the name of the Lord. And so your motivation is that what? I just must do what? Make this money. And so all of a sudden, your belief system, by virtue of your background, it has been installed within you that until I make money, life will have no meaning. Praise God. For some of us, we have been denied affection. And so we try to do it that, you know, I will sleep and do whatever it needs to do so that somebody will get to tell me I love you. So such that when they tell you I love you, you assume that at that point in time, I've climbed the highest climax of life. For some of us, it's a job. For some, it's what children. For some, it's this thing called marriage. I remember I had a friend. We were joking one day in Bible study. And we were, and we were saying that, ah, Jesus is coming soon. Jesus is coming soon. He said, ah, no, Jesus should wait, oh. He has to wait. I need to get married and sleep with my husband. So then he can come. Because at that point in time, she has kept herself. She's a good Christian lady. But her own was that I just must enjoy this thing called physical intimacy. Praise the name of the Lord. And so it's the tyranny of things. And those, so these things hold us in captivity. Am I making sense? And so you understand that when God wants to take his rightful place, remember I said, God either takes it what? All or what? Nothing. And so this is a journey every believer must go through. Because God must take his rightful what? Place. Praise the name of the Lord. I'll finish in three minutes because I see my time is up. God must do what? Take his what? Rightful place in your heart. And so from the day you say God, because remember I said that what? You need God for survival. And so for anybody who is interested in surviving, you would have to cry out and say, God, you are the one that I really want. Praise God. That's the, that's the prevenient grace at work. Praise the name of the Lord. But you understand that the moment you pray that prayer and you pray it sincerely, you may not understand the extent of what you prayed for, but you have already engineered a process. And that process simply means that what? When God comes into your heart, he must dethrone every other God. Praise the name of the Lord. He must do what? Dethrone every other. Let's look at the scripture. Now, the Bible says in the book of 1 Samuel chapter 5, for many of us who understand the story, by virtue of the children of Israel disobeying God and doing ungodly things, the Philistines came into a fight and they stole the ark of God. Praise the name of the Lord. And for many of us who understand what the ark of God meant, in the Old Testament, anywhere the ark of God was, was where God was physically. Praise the name of the Lord. And so technically speaking, when the Philistines took the ark, they stole God. Technically, I did not say that you can steal God because someone can watch it online now. And next thing I'll see myself trending tomorrow. Get the whole story. Get the whole story. 
Praise the name of the Lord. I did not say that you can steal God. Praise God. And so they stole the Ark of Covenant. Praise God. And they brought it into the camp of the Philistines. And they kept the Ark of God where what? Their gods was dwelling. Because remember, God is the all supreme. You cannot. Cont- That's why. The, the song we sang, no other God can be called a father. You know, like, no one can dare share his glory. It's either he comes and stays or he goes. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. And so the Bible said here that what? When the Philistines took the ark of God, they brought it into the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. And when the people of Ashdod arose in the early morning, There was Dagon falling on its face to the earth before the ark. He must bow. Praise the name of the Lord. Now it says that what? So they took Dagon and set it in its place again. Verse 4. And when they arose early the next morning, there was Dagon falling on its face to the ground before the ark of God. The head of Dagon and both the palms of its hands were broken off on the threshold. Only Dagon's torso was left of it. Praise the name of the Lord. And so you realize that when God wants to deal with you, he must do what I call what? The circumcision of your heart. It's not that God does not want you to have it. Praise God. So that's, the, that's what I call the paradox or the irony of things so to speak it's not that god does not want you to have it but if you are going to have it it must be him that gave you praise god such that he maintains that what he's your source and not anybody else and so abraham when god encountered abraham i'm beginning to round up when god encountered abraham he told abraham I am your sufficient reward. In other words, if you're looking for anything, it's me. I am your exceedingly great what? Reward. And God promised Abraham that he would be a father of many generations. But circumstances set in. And Abraham, remember, God gave you a promise. And so we believe, after all, I'll be a father. And so he wanted to engineer the testimony himself. We are still suffering for that engineering to today. Praise God. And so, by virtue of what he did, eventually we know how the story ended and he sent away Haggai and Ishmael. Now, the moral of the story I want to share is that before God told Abraham to go and sacrifice Isaac, we see from scripture that Isaac was Abraham's God. Praise the name of the Lord. That's why I said that when the Bible said that you must search with me for with all what your heart. And so that journey is a journey every believer must go through. If you have not gone through it yet, get ready. It's not a threat, but as painful as it is, you'll be better off for it. Praise the name of the Lord. Why? Because nobody can contend, must contend with God in your heart. It must be him and him what? Alone. And so, when God told Moses, sorry, when God told Abraham, he says, take thy what? Only son. Isaac was not Abraham's only son. But he said, take thy only son. In case you are not sure, he says, the one that you do what? The one that you love. Praise God. That is the one I'm referring to. And so when God is pointing at you to things, to give up, you know, because when you come to God, they say, oh, you know, I gave up smoking, I gave up drinking. Perhaps that's not what you love. Praise God. But when God is coming to take his place, he will point at what you love. It could be your career. It's not that God does not want you to have a career. But he must, you must go through that circumcision. Because only then are you able to prove that you are truly pursuing God. Because then when he takes his right, that's why we live our lives pursuing things. Not realizing that in God 
we get everything that we're truly pursuing. Let us bow our heads as we pray. Let's just begin to bless the name of the Lord for all that we have heard. Let's thank him. Let's give him all the glory. Let's ask that the word that, he, that we have heard this hour we made flesh in our lives and that he will be glorified in our lives in the name of Jesus. With all that you have heard, whether you are watching me online or your own ground, if your desire is that God will take his place in your heart, why don't you just open your mouth and just pray that prayer, that simple prayer, and just say, God, come into my heart today and come and take your rightful place. That's what we're praying. That, Lord, come into my heart today and come and take your rightful place. That, Father, in the name of Jesus, as many of us who have said this prayer, that I myself am even praying that prayer on my behalf and my family, that, Lord, you would come and take your rightful place. That nothing would contend with you in our hearts. And that, Lord, you be glorified in our lives in the name of Jesus. Thank you, almighty God in heaven, for in Jesus' mighty and matchless name we have prayed. Amen. <laughs>